started for the second lecture. So today's topic is uh, zoo of patient class. Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, I, I, you probably never heard someone go on for so long about such such a simple equation uh, as these four lectures. So um, just to remind you, this in a sense is science, right? We want to find out uh, what's true about the world based on data about the world. And uh, this is the uh, likelihood or the evidence term. That's what we, the new data we have. This is what we already knew. Uh, and in a sense, science is always like that. I mean, very rarely are we in a situation where we just go into the laboratory or the observatory and say, oh, I don't know anything. Let's just take some data and see what we can figure out. So. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes it's a little like that, but not usually. Uh, and this is our normalization concept, which we're not going to worry about much. Uh, that's what we want. This we never calculate. The prior is where the problem uh, usually comes in, and I think you'll uh, appreciate that more by the uh, end of today's chat. Uh, how problematic priors can be, and. Um, most of the attention of statisticians to this problem has been on uh, looking at the properties of priors and what sort of priors you might choose uh, and so on. Sometimes there is a, uh, a fair amount of work and difficulty some, uh, in calculating the likelihood, but in principle, if you know how you're taking data, you understand your instrumentation, uh, and you have a well-posed model, uh, that's, that's a a fixed calculation it may not be an easy calculation to do, but you don't have much choice. Uh, the prior, on the other hand, how you represent what you already know, uh, is uh, often a matter of judgment, and they're they're very you have a lot of flexibility in that. Uh, this, of course, is one of the objections to Bayesian statistics: is is all of this flexibility you have? Uh, you gave, I gave examples of that last time, like uh, in the medical example where. You're trying to decide if I have the disease or not. You need to know for the prior what fraction of the population has the disease, and then you modify that with uh, the results of the test. A lot do you use what fraction of the whole population has the disease, what fraction of men have the disease, what fraction of men over the age of 60 have the disease, what men over the age of 60 that talk about Bayesian statistics have the disease, you know. Uh, you use as a prior every number you have ever seen between zero and one, which is a you know, stupid, but um, in a sense, possible choice. So um, today, what I really want to do for you um, is just go through some of the categories uh, of, of priors and uh, that mathematicians have uh, investigated. To some extent, I'll just be talking about uh, the sort of jargon and terminology of the field, but I want to explain to you what the different types of uh, priors are and what their advantages and disadvantages are and why you might use them in different uh, situations and so on. And if there's time enough at the end, uh, I'll say uh, a bit about the properties of posteriors and Bayes ratios and some other things. Uh, but I do want to emphasize these are not exclusive classes. These are they're more like more like adjectives than categories. That is to say, something could easily be uh, in, uh, a prior can be in multiple classes uh, in the sense we're talking. Uh, so the first one is just proper or improper priors. Um, and all a proper prior is, is one which integrated over the model space is equal to one. So that's proper. Or can be made equal to one by okay, put a constant in front of it if you're, if you're having problems with the analytic form. And an improper one. Uh, is one that diverges, that goes off to infinity for all possible uh, models. And a strictly uh, mathematical view uh, is that an improper prior 
should never be used and invalidates the whole equation and you know it just makes the, um, the whole procedure meaningless uh, if you can't normalize your prior. In practice for working physicists, improper priors are usually okay, but uh, are all, well, I shouldn't say usually, are often okay. Uh, but you should check. So this is a little practical tip, whether you're sensitive to it or not. Uh, and just to give an example, last time we talked about the uh, uh, stellar uh, photometry case. Uh, are there people here who were not here last time? If you were, um, all right. Uh, well, if just to review for a second, if we uh, take the probability that a star has some flux, uh, a star given some photometric data, um, you can write that as the probability that S star will give you the observed flux, what you actually got, times the probability that of the star having some flux, some true brightness before you did the integration. So this is uh, just some Gaussian thing, if you have nicely behaved numbers. <coughs> and if you use number counts of sources, you can approximate this as a power law. And you get curves uh, depending on the signal to noise that are the convolution of some Gaussian, that's this term, with some power law that looks like that, that's that term. Uh, and of course this diverges off at, at zero, so it's an improper prior. Now, this produces things uh, as a, I guess I have another color handy. This produces offsets that are a little higher on this wing and a little lower on that wing. So it moves you down from, uh, from just saying S star is equal to S zero to saying that uh, S star is a little less than S zero. So I gave you this analytic form, S star is a half plus a half square root of one minus four Q plus four over R squared, where R, R is the signal to noise. Now, um, so that's uh, the result we did uh, last week. And you might notice, uh, and if we do low enough signal to noise, it even becomes visible in a linear plot. But this isn't actually the maximum likelihood. The maximum likelihood is down here, where you multiply infinity times some finite number. So these curves actually look like that sometimes. Um, so if you ask for uh, the maximum likelihood estimator of this posterior, the maximum <laughs> posterior, it would tell you that the star is one of these infinite number of extremely faint stars that uh, are being scattered up in brightness by some extremely rare statistical fluctuation. It could be you know, 50 sigma or whatever. But so shouldn't the exponential always win? Uh, no, because it stops at zero. Oh. So this is some, some number of sigma out here. So if I measure, let's say I make a measurement that's signal to noise of 20, then this is 20 sigma away, which is some finite number. Mm. And as I go closer mm. and closer to zero, the power law blows up. Mm. Um, mm. You know, if you allow negative fluxes, mm. if you don't put, uh, cut off negative fluxes, uh, then the exponential will get arbitrarily small down here, but it's still only finite when this blows up. Mm. So, um, the, that's an, just an example, a trivial example. You wouldn't be fooled into presumably into thinking that the star you're looking at, you know, was actually a 30 sigma deviation of an in, you know, almost infinite number of 
infinite numbers, nearly zero by zero by the stars. Um, and it would be easy to check because if it were, the next time you went back, the star would be there. You would do that, you would do that improbable event again. So um, that's uh, an example of knowing when you're wrong. You know, knowing when the improper uh, prior is getting into trouble. And you should always check you know, if you have an improper prior, a prior that doesn't end right, you should uh, check whether just uh, whether how sensitive you are to those divergences. And a simple way of doing that, of course, is real number counts of stars are not, uh, don't go to infinity and zero flux. At some point, they turn over. So if we use a, a realistic thing for this, you know, it would, it would have some maximum there. Uh, and, and that would suppress this, this um, uh, realistic behavior. Another, but a more a simpler way of, of checking is to just set the prior equal to zero at some outlying range, region of the model. Uh, if, if it's a one parameter model, you can just impose some limits on it and then see how sensitive your results are to where you put those limits. If you move those limits and uh, uh, that you've imposed on the model uh, somewhere and that uh, changes the, you know, the posterior a lot, then you know you're in trouble. Uh, an example of not doing this and getting in trouble is in the early days of uh, uh, stellar population synthesis. Back in the 70s, people would take spectra of a lot of stars uh, and make a complicated model of a, of a spectrum, a spectrum of a lot of individual stars, then they would take a spectrum of a galaxy, and they would say what combination of these stars uh, would add up to this light in the galaxy, and uh, what they uh, typically found was something that made no sense at all if they used an unconstrained uh, model. So they typically imposed what they called astrophysical constraints. This is some of Sandy Faber's uh, early work, which simply said, you know, fixed into the model that the ratio of stars on the horizontal branch to the giant branch to the main sequence of the turnoff and so on had to uh, allow for, you know, had to follow, had to make astrophysical sense in terms of stellar evolution. What wasn't noticed at that time was that the results of those models set right up against those constraints. They lay on the constraints, which was a way of saying that the data were not telling them anything about the stellar population of galaxies. They were simply uh, recovering their prior. So uh, one of the advantages of, of Bayes' theorem is it forces you, or Bayesian analysis, is it forces you to notice something. So anyway, if you have an improper prior, uh, heads up. Another class of priors, or classification of priors, uh, that you'll see quite a bit of, about in statistics literature are called conjugate priors. A conjugate prior uh, is a prior which allows the um, this function and this function to both have uh, the same analytic form. Um, and uh, so if this is a Gaussian, and that could be a Gaussian. And uh, so we pick a form for this but, uh, such that the product uh, uh, gives us what we want. And uh, this, as you might expect, is, is this work was done largely before, um, you know, back in the 60s, for example, when computers weren't so powerful and there was a lot more uh, emphasis on being able to do things analytically. But if you can re uh, represent your likelihood function uh, as some analytic function, then you can often find a different analytic function uh, with other adjustable parameters, uh, which uh, will have this conjugate property. And there are large tables of these and so forth in the literature. Any, any function of the exponential family, as it's called, the functions, uh, uh, has a conjugate, for example. So all sorts of things like chi-squared distributions and exponential distributions and Gaussians and so on uh, have conjugates. So uh, it's uh, when you can use this trick, um, it's, it's handy because
as the posterior comes out in some analytic form, and you can summarize it just by the parameters of that analytic form. Uh, the familiar way, of course, is by a mean and standard deviation. If you, you happen to be in a happy enough situation uh, to get a Gaussian. However, conjugate priors are, are have no. They're just an algebraic convenience, basically. But it's worth uh, looking for, and, and quite often people uh, will uh, write down this in, in reasonably simple cases in some analytic form, and not even bother to check if there's a conjugate available to them. Now, if there's a conjugate available to them, that doesn't actually mean that you should use it, because it may or may not fit your prior knowledge. But if you can fit it to whatever you think your prior knowledge is. Uh, and uh, another example, one reason I'm so fond of the cellar photometry one, is I can multiply anything by a power law and get back a power law. So if this is a power law, that's going to be a power law, whatever this is. So then, then I'm home free. Uh, and of course, I can also make this a power law by making that a power law. Uh, so, uh, you know, if it's a contribution. So, anyway, um, uh, that's. Um, Are you getting a star or zero in this equation? Hmm? It's, it's a left hand side, a zero or a star. In this it's case, example, uh, star. Okay. this is the value of S star. Okay. Uh, it's simple to plot it as S star over S zero, which is something I'm very familiar with. Is zero is observed or is zero is observed? Yes. If zero is observed, S star is the intrinsic. And you are, you are getting S star in there, why is S zero? Not well, I, I don't understand that equation. This equation? Yeah, it's zero star. It's just outside. This, uh, this data should, should be S0. It's S0. So I observe some plots S0. Oh, yeah, then, then we are getting this. Okay. I, think. I just wrote data once. It's just a simple thing. Yeah. Right. Um, and Priors. <laughs> are called informative priors. And informative priors are priors uh, uh, which use, uh, in which you sort of use all of the information you have, or as much information as you have, uh, uh, and are strong priors, the priors that let the, uh, am I moving around? Uh, um, priors that make use of, of all the information you have, however much effect they have on the posterior. So uh, an informative prior uh, might be these number counts example I gave, where we have fairly good information, let's say, if we're looking at stars in a certain uh, range of brightnesses, we may know very well what the background number counts are. Uh, and that, that would be uh, an example of an uh, informative prior. A, uh, a particular class of, of informative priors are called updating priors. And these are typical, typically uh, useful when you're making a measurement of something that's already been measured many times and you just want to improve it. Suppose you are uh, you know, some very clever uh, experimental physicist and you go out and figure out how to measure, uh, let's say, the mass of the electron uh, to better precision than it was measured before. Well, we already know what the mass of the electron is pretty damn well. And uh, so in that sort of case, you want to use uh, uh, what's called an updated prior, where you put in uh, for your prior something like uh, the Gaussian uh, uh, 
centered on the currently best measured version of uh, the uh, parameter, the mass of the electron, with whatever error is quoted in the you know, handbook of physics you're using. Uh, and then you uh, put that in with your data, and it will appropriately update the uh, value of uh, your um, uh, the value you've measured for the mass of the electron to the new value that should go into the um, uh, into the, uh, are there the rules, handbooks. Are there rules about doing the like? Your error needs to be quite a bit smaller than the previous measurement, or uh, is there sort of not, if it's not a big improvement, is that a bad thing to do? Well, if it's, uh, in principle, it updates the value appropriately, whether it's a big improvement or a small improvement. If it's the same precision as previous improvements, it will shrink the error bars by the square root of n plus one compared to the square root of n before and so on. Uh, if it's a lot better measurement, I mean, this is uh, blind and I'm thinking. A sort of example of when this is in one sense a good idea. Now, it's important to say that when you do this, this is not what people like to see reported in the literature. They want to see what you measure, not the updated value compared to everything else. Uh, so in some sense, when you're reporting your, your result, you don't want to use the updated prior, you want to use some, uh, some weaker prior. Uh, however, if you want to make a bet on what the value really is, mm -hmm. that's why I say it's not necessarily the value that goes into your, the abstract of your paper, it's the value that goes into the, mm -hmm. into the uh, new handbook of physics, so to speak, that you're, you're putting out. Now, um, it's, it's interesting to think about Suppose you and we all remember, of course, the faster than light neutrinos that were uh, baffling us all. Uh, how long ago was that? Two years, year and a half? I forget. Two years. Um, and uh, there, of course, uh, we were all, I mean, very few people thought that probably the neutrinos were actually going faster than light. So in our heads, we were sort of using an updated prior. We were taking you know, the previously measured velocities of neutrinos and everything else for that matter, and putting it in uh, a prior that was nearly a delta function. Um, if they had actually used that in their paper, they wouldn't have published the paper because the prior would have overwhelmed their data and would have told them their neutrinos were, were moving at the speed of light. So we can kind of hide us. That would have saved them, since they were wrong, it would have been a problem with the equipment. That would have saved them a lot of embarrassment. Um, but it would have also hidden from them, you know, that their data was telling them a surprise. So it's, uh, you know, the thing about a, a very strong uh, uh, updated prior is that uh, you sort of can't find, or it makes it very difficult to find surprises, because it's telling you you already know the answer, and uh, uh, so on. So, um, <laughs> Uh, a different type of informative prior. Uh, it's called a hierarchical prior. Uh, and oddly enough, hierarchical priors are by different people classified as both uh, uh, informative priors, uh, which means strongly informative ones, and also uh, uh, least informative, which is confusing. But anyway, the way a hierarchical prior works is, let's suppose uh, uh, is that you use the data to set parameters of your prior in addition to using it in the likelihood time. So you sort of use your data twice, which seems to me to make the data stronger, not the prior stronger, but uh, um, you go through uh, priors twice in this procedure. So an example of that, again, would be uh, this, um, you know, my favorite example up there. Suppose we're, we're trying to measure the brightness of some very faint stars in, let's say, the Hubble high ultra deep field. So these are really faint, or faint galaxies, more likely. Um, and so we want to follow this procedure, but we don't actually know what the slope of the number magnitude counts are. In fact, that, 
is one of the reasons we want to study the data in the first place. We're, we're looking you know, 10 times deeper or something than we've ever looked before. So uh, what are we going to use for the slope of the counts? And uh, one way of doing that, of course, is to extrapolate the slopes from brighter magnitudes and just hope the slope doesn't change. Uh, another way of doing it is to build some, uh, look into some complex theoretical model of galaxy evolution and formation and uh, K corrections and so on, and a cosmological model, and put in a theoretical prediction for what the shape of the number of magnitude counts can be. Uh, these choices will affect what you, your best guess would be uh, at the magnitude of this. But another approach is uh, a hierarchical prior approach where you use the data to um, actually set the slope uh, of the um, sample you're going to uh, do. So you go around, uh, so in this case, you do something like, what's the probability of Q? Q is... So I can make the model, I can measure Q from the data, so here the data is just going to be a list of the measured SO1, SO2, can be a list of the brightness, the fluxes I've measured for every star in the field. That's the probability of measuring those fluxes given a Q, and I can put in some weak prior on Q, and I can find the probability distribution of Qs, the PBM. And then I can feed that uh, into this to derive a uh, probability distribution for the brightness of any particular object I'm, I'm interested in. So you can kind of uh, iterate or use the data to define the prior and then use the prior to, to adjust your uh, estimate of the, of the correctness of the model or the, uh, the correction in this case of the fluxes. So that's that's a so-called hierarchical uh, problem. By the way, if you actually want to use some of these things, uh, I would advise you to go look in the statistics textbooks and because I'm just giving you know, I don't have time to give you much more. Brief overview uh, of these things. I just mostly want you to, to know they're there and available. Um, so, so, sorry, so is, is it better for the hierarchical case to actually do it in an iterative fashion or you actually you use? You, you assume a prior with some parameters, mm -hmm. is typically how you do it, and you look at the data to measure those parameters. No, but do you do that, or you usually just uh, assume that the parameters of this prior are also something you want to determine, and then marginalize over it rather than do it iteratively? Uh, you can do that. Too. I think so. Because this can get confusing, right? Because you're using already the data to determine your Q, and then so there may not be independence and so on. So right. You're, you're, in yeah. some sense, you're, you're using what you have measured to correct what you have measured based on some higher order prior. Right. And it's not, it doesn't have very clean properties, but the prior. But if you marginalize assuming the, the parameters of the prior distribution, that should be okay, I guess. Right? I don't um, think it's any different, basically. Mm. Okay. But we'll come to marginalization in later. Yes, but I'm not going to. It is, well, it is defined properly. It can be defined. Uh, it, it can be defined by writing down a chain of, of Bayesian rules where you put in for the prior. You know, you basically just. So you basically just 
put in for the prior another version of basis equation. It's just simple, very much a basic equation enough to fix what is hierarchy of fire. And can you tell me, this is the hierarchy of fire, this is a predicted fire. You are right. What, this is a hierarchical prior of what this is? Well, what is a predicted fire? An updating prior just means that you use. There, you just use all the pre-existing measurements. It's not. It's not hierarchical. You don't use the latest one. So, okay. so updating prior is hierarchical. Yes. In, in an hierarchical prior, you're fixing the parameters of the prior mm -hmm. by looking at the same. Uh, an updating prior, you change parameters prior. Well, in an updating prior, you're just using whatever you previously used. Which could be parameters that have already been measured in an analytic prior, or it could be a numerical distribution. Mm -hmm. um, so, a weekly informative prior. Also called with a lot of topics in the literature. Um, is a class of, class of priors, uh, which is some, again, these are uh, uh, it should be almost flat in some sense, meaning uh, that the prior shouldn't change very quickly as a function of the model. So the deep C prior D model should be fairly small, but should uh, <coughs> eliminate um, uh, violations of previous model. Um, now, a, what uh, that means is that you should uh, have you should, uh, a, a weekly informative prior is one that uh, doesn't change or <clears throat> very fast at all over the range of uh, models that you're considering or interested in, but actually eliminates or cuts out things that you're sure of. Uh, an example of a, uh, of a week uh, prior would be, you may remember, once again, when we discussed this example last time, uh, as Alexi uh, suggested, I think, uh, we should eliminate uh, negative flux stars. So a prior that's just a step function uh, at zero. Uh, is a weekly uh, informative prior. Now, the reason uh, it says almost flat is an utterly flat prior is improper and will often cause you problems by uh, being improper, although in this particular case, uh, it doesn't really cause serious problems. The fact that it's divergent but, uh, at large, uh, a star over a small, it's not divergent fast enough to overcome the galaxy. Uh, but a, a common form of a weekly informative prior, which is uh, called, often called a vague or diffuse prior, is, uh, and what that is, is an analytic prior. Large scale parameters. And uh, so that's simply a way of uh, ensuring that the, the prior is proper. Uh, you can form, choose an analytic form that's uh, integral. 
uh, and then set the scale factor to very large. So uh, in our simple case that we keep coming back to, we could, for instance, take the uh, prior as a Gaussian um, with a variance of you know, 10,000 in SR over S0 or something. So it would be very, very flat, um, but, uh, uh, but converging. Um, now, the uh, so so for the almost flat case, there's also this question about how you choose the parameter, whether you choose x or x square, right, and then right. almost okay. I, I will come to that. Right. right. Make, make a great deal of noise about it. But, uh, <laughs> um, and um, the uh, you might say, well, why use a weakly informative prior at all? Uh, since uh, you know we. Presumably, we would like to get as, as good a, a posterior as possible. Um, and um, the one shows one that's so good for the idea of life working with white chalk. Anyway, the, um, uh, the reason you might want to use a weekly informed prior. Uh, uh, is it sometimes said to let the data speak for themselves. Uh, that is to say, a weekly informative prior uh, is one that will prevent the data from saying something that's crazy, uh, but allow it uh, to otherwise more or less say whatever uh, it, it wants to say. It puts in a little of your uh, pre-knowledge. So uh, a thing that you can often do is compare uh, your posterior calculated weekly informative prior to your posterior calculated with an informative prior. Uh, if those are very different, uh, it means that in the informative prior case, the prior is, is giving you a lot of information. It's having a big effect. If they're almost the same, it means you know that you uh, don't really have to care that much about the prior because uh, the data is, uh, is basically telling you the answer. Um, Weekly informative priors tend to uh, appeal to uh, people who have uh, tried to think in classical statistical terms, I would say, uh, because they give results like classical statistical results. Statistical results. And they're okay, but uh, uh, I think you do have to keep in mind that if you knowingly uh, uh, adopt them, you're going to be getting wrong answers. Again, the stellar photometry case we use. Just the uh, requirement that the flux be positive definite, uh, we will systematically overestimate the brightness of our, uh, our faint sources that are close to the limit. Um, so it's you know, not the way to get the answer. Um, all right, then there are. Uh, Flies when they're having fun. Um, so called least informative prior. <clears throat> this is a term uh, which, or a concept and term which was brought along by, in a sense, the um, combination of the realization that um, uh, priors are problematic and uncertain and uh, arbitrary, but unavoidable. It's sort of a product of the period in the history of statistics uh, when people were very resistant to Bayesian statistics and wanted to make things as un-Bayesian as possible. Um, but uh, had to come to the point where they understood that, in fact, uh, you know, you don't get this unless you use Bayes' theorem. Uh, so uh, there are a number of types of, of, of least informative um, uh, priors. Um, and uh, first, um, uh, let me talk about the, the original uh, favorite Everyone's favorite, at least in form of the fire, was the absolute flat one. And uh, 
often have to be truncated. To be proper, I mean, it does have to be truncated to be proper. Uh, as some, in some way or another, but uh, let's just think of the thought prior. And uh, well, you just pointed out the problem with it. Uh, suppose I want to fit y equals a as plus b, and I want to fit for these parameters. Uh, we all know how to do that, right? What do you do? It's chi squared. Uh, you can, it's a fun exercise. You can derive the, the formulas for least chi squares by using a flat prior uh, and the data. You would get out that uh, you could minimize chi square to get the value of, let's say, A. Suppose instead, though, I wanted to fit uh, y equals x over c plus b. That seems pretty much equivalent. I think it all right. A equals one over C. But suppose we're interested in C. So should I use a flat prior in C? No, probably. It turns out I'll get a totally different result. Minimizing chi square will not give you the same uh, by uh, adjusting C as uh, by adjusting A. And in fact, something every a working scientist should know is chi squared, minimum chi squared is a biased estimate for anything that's not a linear function. If dy dx is not a constant, then the parameter, you know, if, if I have this is a slight aside, but if y is equal to function of x and parameters a and b and b a is not equal to constant. Then chi squared is no good; it's biased. This mistake is made all the time in astronomy, constantly. Physics and so on. A simple example that uh, has caused some confusion is in fitting the orbits of uh, exoplanets to radial velocity data and fitting an eccentricity to the orbit. Well, the radial velocity is not linear, and the eccentricity is a you know, complex algebraic function. Uh, I don't that complex. But anyway, it's not linear. And so uh, estimates of the eccentricity that made by uh, fitting. Uh, Minimum chi square to the radial velocity curve systematically overestimate the eccentricity, no matter how large the eccentricity is. Even if the true eccentricity is 0.9999, uh, the estimate, <coughs> and then the estimate you get <coughs> from a chi square fit will tend to overestimate. Uh, for those not familiar with statistical jargon, <coughs> an estimator is anything that converges on the true value for infinite data. Infinitely much data. <clears throat> and chi square is an estimator, has that problem. A biased estimator preferentially converges from one direction to the other. Um, but uh, in particular, this is a this is a very stark case. Suppose uh, I think A is somewhere on the interval between say 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the 3. That's my prior. It's going to be flat over that interval. <coughs> then that means, of course, C uh, is also uh, defined on this interval. But now see how much of the prior probability is in an interval, let's say, of A between 1 and 0.001. Well, that is approximately 10 to the minus 3 of the probability of setting, you know, approximating that as 0. The prior thinks that the chance that A 
is between uh, 0.001 and 1 is roughly 10 to the minus 3. However, uh, A in that interval corresponds to C uh, in the interval between uh, 1 and 1,000. What's the chance in a flat distribution that uh, it's in that interval? Well, it's, it's approximately 1 minus 10 to the minus 3. So, fitting A, the flat prior thinks that we're almost certain to have a, a, a large-ish A, or very unlikely to have a small A, and fitting C thinks just the opposite. So, uh, flat priors are no good. Uh, and uh, so that was an upset of the realization. Uh, and led to uh, the development of uh, uh, no, a few developments, one of which the most interesting one of which is the Jeffreys prior. The Jeffreys prior is a prior which is um, insensitive to, and your estimate of uh, the posterior will be insensitive to transformations of the parameters mm. like this. Now, uh, it uh, is surprising, I think, that, that even such a thing exists. Uh, it seems surprising to me, at least. Uh, and it was surprising to statisticians sufficiently so that they uh, they named uh, Harold. They named it after Harold Jeffries, who discovered it in the sixties. A, a, a statistician, and uh, the, so the Jeffries prior uh, is a prior that's proportional to the square root of the determinant. Theta is equal to the Fisher information uh, in the in the likelihood. So if you have this function, you take the uh, the Fisher information and uh, the square root of that. The determinant of that uh, is uh, it can be a matrix because uh, we're considering here theta to be it doesn't have to be just a scalar parameter. Uh, and for those of you who don't remember what the Fisher information looks like, like me, uh, it's the integral. Of the partial different derivative with respect to theta of the log of the uh, likelihood term, the probability of the data. Fisher discovered this in the 50s, and it's a measure of the information in uh, the model, I mean, in the likelihood term, in the data, uh, about the model. So uh, you can sit and stare at this a while, uh, or you can look on Fisher's papers, or look up some textbook, and it sort of generally makes sense. Uh, I got lost, actually, in trying to follow Jeffrey's proof to show that uh, that this uh, uh, choice of the prior making it 
proportion of the square root of the determinant of that uh, number of that matrix uh, is uh, you know has the property of, of uh, uh, being transformation uh, invariant. But uh, it sort of in a qualitative way makes sense because it's just looking at the information there, the, inf the information about the model and the data. And the, the information isn't going to change uh, when change the, uh, you know, the, the way you parameterize the model. If it's the equivalent model with just a different set of parameters, it doesn't can't have any effect on how much the data knows about the model. So what's, what's up, uh, actually a problem with how to get to your time to? What is a problem? Well, yeah. That this yeah, can be applied to? It's just a mathematical problem, but you're trying to solve that problem. Yes, for example, it could be applied to this problem yes. and, and solve it. Or, uh, a different example of a problem that could be applied to, actually, I don't have much time, but uh, there, there's a, uh, a paper that uh, Dave Spiegel and I published in the publication of the National, uh, of the National Academy, uh, where we showed that a problem uh, in astrobiology had been done incorrectly uh, by using a flat prior and laid out an answer that was insensitive to the data. But uh, sensitive to the uh, uh, prior, and if you use a, a proper Jeffrey's prior, you, get, uh, you find out what the data is actually telling you. Um, Does this depend at all on the actual form? Hmm? Does, does there any dependence on the actual form that you think the data Right, it, has a, it depends on the likelihood of the data. Is this always Jeffrey's prior? Is always. As far as I understand it, Jeffrey's prior should always be the case, true, for any given, I mean, it, ch it will change if you change your model of what the probability of the data is. Um, again, I would advise you going to the textbooks and really studying it carefully if you want to, uh, if you want to use this. Uh, and I, I think there's some restrictions on the type of transformation of the parameters you can do. You know, if you just take a, uh, uh, a model, and this again is, is uh, seeded in big work being done in the 60s in, in analytic treatments of Bayes' equation more than the equation you parameterize. These days, when you do in C and C and so on, and everything's numerical, it's, a, it's a not clear to me that this is as useful as it can be. Um, let me just finish the list. That's about all we're going to have time for. But uh, sort of inspired by Jeffrey's there uh, work, there are what are called maximum entropy um, priors. Uh, and the way um, the maximum entropy prior works is you first have to decide define a set of candidate priors, uh, and then you again evaluate the, uh, uh, you look at the Fisher information, not in the likelihood term, but in the prior term, uh, and you minimize that information, which is like maximizing the entropy. So you try to find the prior that knows the least, uh, you know, sort of the least constraint, and that's a, that's a well-defined uh, mathematical maximization uh, process, which will give you, you know, a different function. It's not necessarily independent of parameter transformation, but it is uh, uh, you know, one of the things. And then there are things called reference priors. Which again are defined with respect to a set of candidate priors. And the reference prior chooses the prior. So this, uh, sorry, this is a, a minimum info. Prior. This maximizes the difference. Period. 
this seems uh, that's very radical a reference prior. It's saying choose a prior that is as different from the data as you possibly as to what the data wants to tell you uh, as you as you possibly can, or a prior that is maximally sensitive uh, to the data that, uh, that will jump to a, a posterior that's very different from the data. So um, the, uh, here again, you can do things analytically in some cases. You could also do them numerically if you had a set of priors. You choose the one in which the prior is the least like the posterior. I'm not clear on why that makes sense, actually. But maybe it's a strategy for getting the paper in nature. <laughs> You know, or getting journalists to cover it. Journalists would love to write, you know, scientists stunned by new uh, discoveries that we spent most of our time sitting around their offices half unconscious from studying new results. But in any case, it is a technique for um, uh, um, finding a prior uh, which um, is the least like the posterior you get as possible. And you can define different types of reference priors, use different measures of what that difference is. Uh, you, know, you have two functions, and so you can, you, know, you can maximize the difference in the mean or like many different things. Um, in this case, it seems like you don't need to evaluate the set of priors you want to choose and the set of procedures you get. Right, right. so you. you you have to make an interpretation about both of them. Well, you have to define a difference and then for each, um, and then try each prior and calculate the posterior and evaluate how big the difference is by whatever definition of difference you have. Again, if things are analytic enough, you can you know, write down that difference as an equation and make it and you know, find the maximum. You know, but uh, with real actual data sets, that's not so bad. But shouldn't the ratio be independent of the prior? I mean, that should just be the likelihood, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if as a difference you just look at the ratio between the posterior and the prior. Well, if, if I define a, um, uh, if I define the prior, well, not necessarily. In other words, if I set the prior equal to the posterior, I mean, if I set the posterior equal to the to the data, so you know, basically equal to that, then uh, that is might be very different from the you know prior, but it depends on what my family of priors it is. Now there also exists in the literature last one. And simple as small. But you'll see the term quite a bit. Uh, not so much recently. Mm -hmm. well, an uninformed prior. Which was taken to mean uh, a prior uh, that uh, has no effect. At all. Uh, and uh, mathematicians for a while managed to convince themselves that, this, that such things might exist in some complicated, but has now been proven. The useful thing about uninformed priors uh, is that they do not exist. So you don't need to spend too much time looking for them. Um, in a sense, that's that's a dead obvious. This is just a prime. It's like asking me to find a value of c that doesn't affect the value of a. I can set c equal to one, and a is equal to b, but it's still affecting the value of a. Uh, and uh, but again, in fitting complex models with many parameters and so on, uh, somehow it's impossible to come up. Shown sometime in the 90s, I think, that such things don't exist in general. It's sort of seems obvious, but mathematicians are hard to convince of the obvious thing most of the time. So, uh, which is perhaps a good thing. Uh, but um, since sometimes the obvious things aren't actually true. Uh, so, anyway, this uh, zoom of, of uh, priors uh, might make you even less inclined than you were. 
before to try Bayesian analyses. Uh, but uh, in fact, it shows that the ability to choose priors actually uh, allows you to learn more about your experiment and your data and what the data is saying about previous knowledge. Thing. It's actually probably the case that if you go to the trouble of uh, you know, building a hundred million telescope costing hundreds of millions and instruments costing tens of millions and devoting the uh, uh, person years of, of, of effort into taking the data, designing the data, you know, reducing the data, you probably ought to go to the trouble of doing a rather exhaustive statistical analysis to get the most out of it. And that probably means not doing a Bayesian analysis, but doing a set of Bayesian analyses with different priors that have different advantages and disadvantages, which illuminate different points about the uh, data and give you different insights into it. Uh, at the very least, you have a better plot at the end, the posterior, uh, with respect to your uh, and, and your prior, and uh, see what's changed and how much has changed and why and so on. One of the big advantages, the second biggest advantage of Bayes' theorem, or of Bayes' analysis, uh, is that it forces you to be explicit about and to see, have insights into what you're doing in the statistical analysis. They're often hidden uh, in more quick and frequent analyses where you are, are just uh, have implicit priors and uh, are not so sure of what's sensitive to why. What the choices you've made are with respect to the So, uh, I think if you work through or uh, force yourself to publish a Bayesian analysis, uh, you're making a lot of things uh, explicit that are otherwise uh, often hidden. Uh, by the way, the biggest advantage of the Bayesian problem is, of course, if you do a better, uh, more, better chance of getting correct and not uh, accurate results. Okay, uh, I've gone over a little. And uh, next time, uh, we'll talk some about posteriors, and I think probably uh, the good thing to start talking about is much uh, more complicated situations uh, where we're dealing with multi-parameter models and big data and non-analytic uh, priors and all of that sort of thing, and all of the CNC. Um, uh, but uh, please do you know, ask questions now or you want to talk to me after the last, uh, our last session and gave me some uh, directions to talk about this time. So if there's other stuff you want to do, about, uh, let me Thank you. Any uh, good questions? Okay. Even no, it's not. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks.